creates partnerships with senior lead officers and police to have rapid response if there is a homeless situation with the Department of Health, especially in Los Angeles County and other counties, to come out if there's a mental health problem. And additionally, it hooks up with nonprofits. So you're not just sending somebody away because they don't just go away. You figure out some type of productive partnership to allow people to get help. And that's what 7-Eleven does and does it constantly. It's a constant battle, but it's one that they don't quit at. And by not quitting, they always have that chance to win and push it forward. Additionally, in terms of crime, when you have a uh, when you don't have a 7-Eleven and you have a blighted corner, it's dark, it's blighted. 7-Eleven comes, it gets light, it gets bright. You have a corner that also has state-of-the-art security system and cameras. Police often come to our 7-Elevens to look if there was a crime or an accident that has happened. They come in, we allow them to look at the tape. Very integral part of what happens in the community. Uh, additionally, in terms of theft and uh, inside the store, uh, Cash registers are only allowed to have $50 during the day. And after 8 p.m., it goes down to 35. If you give a $20 bill, they have these time lock safes that they go ahead and drop. So consistently, over time, this is lessons learned, they constantly control that by dropping the money and keeping it light in the drawer. So imagine that. You steal from 1711, shoot, I got 20 bucks, it's not going to happen again. So these are precautions that have been taken and precautions that have uh, shown to work very well. Um, and uh, lastly, great fixed alarm systems with remote ac uh, activator devices that each employee has inside their pocket. And lastly, um, you know, we're not selling alcohol 24 hours a day, but when it's stopped between those hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., the doors are locked. So nobody could come in and do a beer run at that time. Did I stay under the timeline? You did. Very you good. You a minute left, so. Very good. Um, what, what, what would you like to talk about? I'm kidding. We're all, uh, we're all very good. Thank you. Mr. Delano? Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, I'm sorry. Welcome to my neighborhood. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to mention is from a planning perspective. Um, Mr. Cooper mentioned that the same designers are affiliated with this, this design. However, those uh, developments went through a specific plan. It's a much higher quality, develop, much higher quality review, has an EIR associated with it, so you're not getting apples to apples. Second is, 7-Eleven uh, didn't really mention anything about liquor, and the sales of liquor. Uh, the children mentioned that there is a homeless issue with most of the 7-Elevens, and <clears throat> there isn't any homeless issues here now, so by bringing a 7-Eleven in, you may occur some homeless issues. Um, and I also agree with Mr. Cooper, this is one of the best intersections in Hemet, and therefore it should have something other than a gas station. It should have some, some really nice um, architecture, although the architecture is fine. Um, and um, one of the things that disturbed me a little bit um, is that Mr. Cooper met, said that the, the owner of the project wanted to cash in on this property, and that doesn't seem like the right thing to do in a community. So I'd like you to support the appeal and deny the project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are closing the public hearing, and we'll have some council discussion here. Russ, you want to go first? Sure. Well, first uh, I'd like to just offer an observation of all the participation of all the speakers and the people in the audience. Uh, this is part of municipal government. This is where you can reach out and touch your government. And we don't have a lot of control over what happens in Sacramento and even less control over what happens in Washington. But this is where you get to experience government. And I, I'm very pleased and proud to see all the age groups uh, participating in this process. No matter what decision is made tonight, uh, and basically that's a lesson in life, and I, and I hope the youth are paying attention to that, that 
life is always full of choices. And every decision that you make and everything that you do is going to make somebody happy and probably somebody unhappy. You're playing soccer, you score a goal, your team's happy, the other team's not. Uh, when you walk off the field, though, if you gave it your best, you can hold your head high and know that you did your best. So I just wanted to offer that observation about the process that's going on tonight. And, and we've heard a lot of repetitive comments. And I'll see if I can go through a couple of them that I made note of here. Um, a lot of talk about crime and homeless. Uh, I frequent that shopping center uh, quite a bit. I've traded at the 76 station quite a bit. Uh, I've been approached by panhandlers at the 76 station. I've been approached by panhandlers at a Shell station. I've been approached by panhandlers at a Chevron station. And, and so a lot of that is mitigated by the pride in ownership and operation of the people that are operating the franchise. Uh, people made comments about it's everywhere. Unfortunately, that's true. Job security for our law enforcement personnel, I suppose, but they're improving the situation and with the Measure U funds, we're rebuilding our public safety departments and we're having a better ability to address that. Our ROCKS team is back in service, and they're the ones that are specifically targeting those kinds of problems. So regardless of where your business is, whether it's the 76 station or potentially a 7-Eleven station, the pride and ownership and operation is critical to that. And avail yourself of our public safety resources and call them and report those problems when they're happening. If a customer comes in and says, there's somebody out there that approached me and I felt uncomfortable, you make the call. You make the call on their behalf because it's a representation of your business. And I say that generically regardless of whether it's this proposed business or any existing business. That's a business owner's uh, obligation and responsibility as well as any of our citizens. The, the fact is that we have beer and wine sales at the existing 76 station, as we do with a lot of other uh, gas station mini mart operations. I have to tell you, as a retired cop, I've always been a little bit perplexed by the, the concept of selling beer and wine at a gas station because of the nexus that it creates to uh, potential driving under the influence. Uh, I've always been uh, uh, concerned about that uh, from a public safety standpoint. So again, uh, it's what's being proposed is no different than what already exists. Do I support that personally? Probably not necessarily. But I'm not here just to represent my personal opinion. I'm here to represent the people of Hemet, and, and that's what all of us are here to do. So the, the comments that the children made are very true. Crime is everywhere, and uh, panhandling is everywhere, but you can uh, reasonably address that. I also know, too, that, that property owners have an entitlement to deal with their property, they have certain rights and entitlements that if they have a piece of property that they want to develop or they want to maintain it as it is, those are their entitlements. And we have a process that we require projects to go through. And this project has steadfastly proceeded through those, those uh, processes. And this is the tail end of, of the process. So I think that respecting land ownership, property owners' rights is important, that if they've done the things that the city requires them to do and the findings are uh, supportive of that, uh, I think that we have to uh, be mindful of that. And so 
I think that's all the comments I want to make right now. Um, I also want to thank everybody who, who came out and have expressed their opinions and come to council because it's not always an easy thing to come up and stand there and speak on a subject for or against. So thank you so much. And thank you for bringing the kids out because, you know, another 20 years they're going to be sitting up here. This is a good experience for you. So with that, I, I have some technical questions, and Deanna, I, if I can start with you, you may be able to answer all of them that I have, because I'm sure they're in deep in the reports, and I just don't remember all of the answers. Um, but on the, and this was brought up, but on the hours of operation, the car wash will operate what hours? Uh, let's see, it's in the staff report, but there's um, summer hours and winter hours, and I think... Okay, 7 to 7, this is my helper here, Carol, Se nice. Carol, 7 to 7 during the winter hours and 7 to 9 in the summer hours. Okay, all right, because that is extremely important. Uh, and for the alcohol sales, we did uh, cover that, that it is not a 24-hour sale. It is from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m.? Correct, and what the gentleman was referring to, too, is that they lock the coolers where the alcohol is kept. And that's a condition of approval. Okay. See, I even have a problem with that. But that's my personal objection. And uh, I honestly think at a gas station, we should be cutting off alcohol sales at 10 o'clock at night. Again, my personal opinion, and maybe we can change the ordinances or the uh, whatever later on. We'll talk about it. Um, the, let's see. We are consistent on the uh, liquor license of a 20, which is beer and wine only. Correct. Because it was brought up that, yes, this council did deny the, uh, the hard spirits to the Chevron station several years ago because, and actually that's, that's the same argument that was used. It was that the Walmart and Walgreens had hard spirits and we really didn't need another one in the corner. So now we have the same argument against 7-Eleven that Chevron is using. You don't need beer and wine across the street. So it kind of evens up. Um, a couple other, what is, what was the issue that was brought up by Maria Cassian, Cassian on the placement of the gas tanks and not being able to get homeowner's insurance? Was that the reference? Uh, yes. A uh, a provision in terms of the location of the gas tanks and the distance, separation distance from residential and the ability to get FHA insurance. So, um, and actually the technical consultant, their quality consultant could probably answer it in more detail, but essentially I figure what the measurement is if it's 100 such feet, but it's the existing Union 76 station is already affecting a portion of the Willowock neighborhood and the new station will also affect a portion of the neighborhood. Um, but it hasn't prevented Willow Walk from developing. It hasn't prevented people from moving in. Uh, and uh, we've, ne we've never heard of an issue where that's created around a gas station. Are there any, any ways to mitigate that in any type of construction or in any type of, of anything? Mike Dickerson, MD Acoustics, performed the technical study for the air quality greenhouse gas health risk assessment. As it relates to the setback for gas, uh, gas tanks, there is a South Coast Air Quality Management District actually has a, an enforcement for the gas tanks and the uh, nozzle setback for the number of gallons per year sold through the gas station. So the setback is recommended at 50 feet setback from residential based on the number of gallons per, per year for this site. It, it, far, it for, sorry, it exceeds that setback, obviously. Um, I believe it's up near the 200, 200 range, uh, 200 feet. Uh, for FHA insurance, that's, not, that's kind of out of my scope in terms of that portion, but it does comply with all South Coast Air Quality Management rules. Okay, thank you. Um, where am I here? Okay, and we've ascertained that there's lighting, cameras, security, um, and I guess that's part of the requirement for the project, 
correct? Um, That's that correct. We have that in, yes. in our ordinances. Uh, it brought up the, the graffiti, and I can only hope that we can encourage, uh, and I know that's sometimes hard to do, but we like to encourage all new businesses that come to town that they have the pride of ownership, that they police, excuse the expression, police their own graffiti and make sure that it is cleaned up, and there, uh, there are a multitude of ways to do it, and when it gets really nasty, then uh, our contract with Valley Wide can kick in, and our own public resource, public uh, yeah, public works. And actually, our requirements, the city's ordinance in, re in granting alcoholic beverage permits has a provision for graffiti, and graffiti removal has to be within uh, 24 or 48 hours, and it is the responsibility of the business owner. Okay. Then one, one last, and this was brought up by Mr. Hoban from, uh, and I apologize that I pronounced your name wrong, of Tommy's Express Car Wash that to make sure that the conditions uh, to, uh, to be verified with 100% recycled water and a sound level not to exceed, and I was kind of confused on this, the sound level not to exceed that which is put out by micrometer currently. I didn't know they were noisy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. in, in terms of those two requirements, uh, I know Quick Quack as, as well as Tommy's utilizes recycled water. You pretty much have to with all the water quality and conservation regulations. I don't know exactly what that means in terms of 100%, so that would probably be a question for Quick Quack to be able to determine if there's some operational nuance there that we're not aware of. As far as the sound levels, uh, the, again, uh, we had a detailed noise analysis in terms of any of the noise coming from the vacuums or from the car wash itself, as well as the gas station to the adjacent neighbor. I don't know really what the um, point would be in terms of the micrometer. Uh, most of their operations are indoor, uh, but they did have to construct the wall, the original, the 16-foot wall was to aid in that separation and that buffering from the when So Macrometer was there first, and then Willowak was built. Right. So Willowak was required to put the, the wall. Um, so uh, what I can tell you is that it does comply with all the noise requirements for single-family residential development and having sufficient. Okay. Did you want to expand on that? To the point on the on the ordinance for micrometer, micrometer is required to comply with the city's noise ordinance, okay, which is an hourly LEQ standard, 60 decibels, uh, which is measured over an hour. Uh, the noise study definitely looks at the vacuums, the queuing, the operations from the entire project, and compares it to that standard with the existing and existing plus project conditions, and therefore mitigation in, in various project design features were implemented into the design to make sure it complies with that city ordinance. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the recycling of the water, so we're, we're building a small water treatment plant on site. Everything that is that comes into the car wash is recaptured in reclaimed tanks and it's pumped back into the car wash. So essentially we're reusing the water that's coming out there's discharge because there's added soaps. Um, we use a reverse osmosis system that has a, a reject amount of water that comes out, so we are discharging some water into the public system, but it, it's, it's being discharged into the sewer system after it's already been cleaned. Okay. Thank you very much. And... Yes, absolutely. Just, excuse me. I just want to follow up... Uh, just for some clarification on, on the water. Sure. So the term 100% recycled, basically that that's not entirely accurate because there's always going to be water loss. I mean, there's, there's always a discharge. When, when I go, when I go wash, through a car a wash, I go through the blowers and it blows water off. I know that water's not getting reclaimed somewhere because it's evaporating and, and the little beads of water are still on my car when I drive out. So. It's a little bit of a misnomer to anticipate that 100%, but I think I don't believe the implication is that the water is, it's not, you're not using water, like if I were to wash my car in the driveway and wash my car and that water just runs off down the street. So when you're saying it's recy recycled, reclaimed, so it's processed and it's reapplied to the car, but there is admittedly some loss, right? That's correct. Thank you.
Yeah, when you're washing the car in the driveway, it's going into the storm sewer versus the, the sanitary sewer, which is where we discharge. I think I'm done. Okay. Well, I, um, I don't know what else more to add. A lot of the questions have already been answered that I had. But I will tell you that, again, I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight and, um, and actively being engaged in what happens in your community. Um, I will tell you that I live very close to that intersection. Um, I travel it every day, back and forth to work. And I appreciate the 100% recycled water because I work for a water district. And so I appreciate that that's being used. Um, but, you know, I, I actually travel um, east and west rather than north and south on that, on that road. But when I do go south, I tell you, a lot of times I, I wish there was a gas station on the, on the east side of the street coming back from the south, coming back, back home. So um, I, uh, I appreciate that I would have a choice, number one, um, as would anybody else traveling uh, north or south. Uh, I actually appreciate the fact that some convenience stores are simply that convenient. And I personally feel more safe running into a convenience store with a small parking lot than walking into a large box store that you have to travel in the dark um, several, distance, or several distances from the facility itself. Competition is good. There's enough people in this community to serve everybody, and competition is good. When you have to worry about competition, you better worry about what you're doing in your own store, because people will be loyal if, you're, if you are um, a if you are excellent, if you have excellent customer service, reasonable prices, they'll come back to you. I don't, I don't see people from coming from the east end of town rushing to that corner to go to 7-Eleven. Now, that's a that's a, a ridiculous thought. That traffic is going to increase, technically, because that 7-Eleven is there. Traffic is still going to be north or um, north and south regardless of whether 7-Eleven is there or not. They're just going to have the ability to have another choice and to have more convenience coming back in the direction that they're, they're coming. So I, um, I, I do have, um, again, I, I won't, go, I won't um, go on talking about the same things that my colleagues have because they all have very good points that I certainly agree with. And I have one question, though, Deanna. What year was... Page Plaza built. Well, it was before my time. Mr. Cooper, 2004. What year was Willowalk built? Uh, I think that was 2006 or 7. So my point is, this big, huge, wonderful development was built right on a busy street. And people chose to move into that development knowing that it has substantial retail development nearby. So... The argument being, if you wanted less traffic, be in an area where there's less traffic. That tra that area has always had a lot of traffic. So, and I I don't buy on the on the argument that um, I wish I could think of the argument. I should have, but I can't think of it now. Uh, Oh, the 7-Eleven is really going to increase the traffic in that area any more than it already is. It's just going to give people traveling that way an opportunity to have a convenience of stopping and not having to turn around and go the other way to um, get gas or whatever. So, like I said, competition is good. Um, it keeps everybody raising the bar, and if they do a good job, everybody will have the business that they want to have anyway. So. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, I have a few things I want to say about it. Um, competition is good. Um, having choices is good. Uh, owner's property rights, I believe in owner's property rights. 
Um, what I also believe are the owner's property rights of the houses behind. And if it was my house, I have four kids, and I would have a fit if something like this was going on the other side of my wall. I've just got to be honest. Um, it's not about uh, knocking 7-Eleven. It's not about saying 7-Eleven is unsafe. It has nothing to do with the brand 7-Eleven, but it's just creating another area, which, by the way, don't give to them when they ask you for money because then they won't take the help I give when I'm trying to get them off the streets. Um, I'm talking about the panhandlers. Uh, we work with homeless people, so um, there are reasons that they hang around there, but... 24-7 uh, operation is still scary for a parent on the other side of the fence. If anybody wants to meet me at 7-Eleven tonight, we can go there at 11 and I can sit there for an hour and you can watch for yourselves. I would, I would do it. So, council, what do we have? Um, one of the uh, comments that was brought up and I don't remember by whom, but we're talking about, I think it was during the, the video of the traffic circulation. Um, do we own the signals at that intersection? Yes. And are the signal controllers of the type that uh, we have a lot of options in the phasing and the timing? Um. I believe so. I mean, it's it's possible to do. I don't know how it is, but so um, it would, yes, it would be reasonable be that if this development were to go in and we experience a significant change in the traffic circulation, traffic signal timing and adjustments could be made to mitigate that somewhat. Yes, and and it's it's usually not just one intersection. You're looking at up upstream and downstream in both directions in terms of, of that. Course. And the uh, traffic consultant for the project did look at all of that uh, and also determined that the project, the existing condition plus the project plus uh, uh, the growth condition would not fail the intersection based on the traffic. It is mostly convenience pass by traffic as opposed to a generation. And uh, to me, when I watched the video, what it showed me is that the intersection cleared in each cycle. Um, so I, I'd say it's, yes, there's people, you know, sometimes you have to go through a couple of cycles, but you're not backing up uh, with cars not able to clear the intersection. Well, that that would be the critical thing is, is when you have turn pockets that are queuing up into a lane of traffic, then that, that becomes a problem, but that can be addressed through signal timing and phasing. The, the other thing, and I, I did not bring it up in in my presentation, although it's certainly in all the materials, is that uh, I think there was one point brought up by um, Mr. Rogers in that uh, the requirements on the project are only right in, right out for both of the driveways, both on Sanderson and Stetson. So even though there is an offset configuration, you would not be able to cross that uh, driveway and do a left in. We are the city of no left turns. <laughs> Okay, before we um, make a motion and vote, I just want everyone to know that if there is a tie vote, then it, the, the decision of the Planning Commission stands. <clears throat> All right, so can I make one, one comment and then a motion? And uh, for Mr. Rogers, I was thoroughly appreciate your comments about the general plan. Uh, I was vice chair of the last general plan in Hammett and spent a couple years getting to know our city and zoning and rules and regs and future planning. So really appreciate your comments. And Mr. Cooper, uh, you know I have fought you tooth and nail on another project you had wanted to bring <laughs> to, bring to Hammett. And I think you'd be very pleased that I am going to make, an emotion, make a motion to adopt a resolution denying the appeal and upholding the Planning Commission approval of Rancho McCollin project, including the adoption of the neg mitigated negative deck and all the rest of that stuff there, and going down to resolution bill number 18-046. And I'll second that. All right, you have a vote? vote.
right? That passes three to one. I will go get the mayor. We're going to go ahead and take a five minute recess while everybody exits the building.